The dream of every electrical engineer is to be able to iterate on PCBs as fast as a 3D print. No waiting for the board shop to ship or paying through the nose for next day boards. I don't think we're there yet, but we are really close. This PCB was made on a fiber laser and it only took 25 minutes, only five of which required me to be involved in any way. If you saw my last video, I made a PCB using an SLA 3D printer and some evil acid and it worked great, but it took a while and it was pretty manual. In the past few years, we've seen desktop fiber lasers come down to a pretty reasonable price. They're definitely still an investment, but at least they're possible to buy. And what's cool about an IR fiber laser is that they have the power and the frequency to cut metal. If you do this to the copper on a blank PCB, you can literally cut out your design with the laser. Xtool kindly sent me their F1 Ultra Fiber Laser to test this out. They sent it to me for free, but this video is not sponsored. Other folks on the internet have done this kind of thing, of ablating the copper with a fiber laser to make PCBs, but I've heard that it's really hard to get right and it's not worth the trouble. Over the past couple of weeks, I've been running a ton of tests to try and figure it out, and I am happy to report it works freaking awesome. I'm gonna go over the main beats here, but if you wanna get into the details and try this at home, I've written up all the instructions in a repository, which I'll link. The first big note here is this really should only work with FR1 and not FR4. If you're not familiar, FR4 is what almost every PCB you've ever interacted with is made out of. It stands for Flame Retardant 4. It is an epoxy fiberglass composite. It's cheap, lightweight, all the good stuff. FR1 is not really used anymore. It's like more of a cardboard with a, a phenolic resin embedded in it, and it's way less abrasive, so if you're milling a PCB, it's ideal. It's not gonna ruin your end mills. The reason I'm going with FR1 for this is that it is so much easier to ablate away the copper and not destroy the, the substrate underneath. If you try and do this with FR4, it gets all stringy and it blackens and it's a supposedly conductive when this happens. I did run a little continuity check close by and I didn't see it being conductive, but I've heard that's the case. FR1 happily gets ablated with no complaints as long as you don't hit it too much it's fine. It like actually is very, very clean and works fantastic in my experience. So with your FR1, you can toss your blank into the laser. The F1 Ultra comes with a little alignment bracket, which is great for re-indexing a board if you want to take it out and do multiple operations. I use this for most stuff and it was pretty good, but it does not cut it if you're also trying to cut out your board. If you want to cut things out, Xtool gives you this heat sink looking thing, which will protect the actual aluminum base plate of the machine, but it does not have an alignment bracket. So if you want to be able to continually align things in multiple operations, and not ruin your aluminum bottom surface, which I already did. It doesn't really do it. So I made a little printed bracket that has a couple dowel pins for aligning and a heat sink that acts as kind of like the cutting surface. And this is what I'm gonna be using moving forward making boards. I didn't use it for all of these tests, but I think it's gonna work great in the future. Now in these boards that I made, the next thing I did was immediately laze the copper. What I found is actually the first operation you should do is drilling holes. This board is an example of what it looks like to drill first or etch first. If you drill all your holes first before you etch, all of the heat you're dumping into the copper has a way bigger ground plane. It's connected to a lot more copper and it's gonna sink that heat better and it won't cause problems with your copper delaminating or just getting all shriveled up and destroyed. You can actually see I drilled after I etched on this board and it completely ruined the adhesive from the copper to the substrate, to the FR1. But I did find some great settings that are pretty consistent. In general, high power, fast speed, lots of passes works great. The trick is to stop before you start destroying a lot of the FR1 underneath. If you're getting a really sharp, shiny uh, ablation that's happening when you're lasing, that's probably the copper. When it comes down quite a bit and it's looking a little bit less intense, you're probably going into the FR1. This also matters a ton based on where you're sourcing your FR1 from. These panels that I bought for testing have the thinnest copper ever. <laughs> like two passes with the laser completely gets through all the copper. But on other older stuff that I've gotten from other sources, it takes six passes. So it actually varies quite a bit, which is unfortunate. So I recommend when you get a new source of this stuff, run a quick little test to see how many passes it actually takes to get all the way through, and then mark that and save that in your settings. After I got this tuned and I did a few of these, they look like crazy good. <laughs> and I, I cannot stress this enough. I am so blown away with how precise this is. It's really cool actually. You can see all the kind of like little pixels of where it's actually trying to ablate all those, that fine resolution of the galvos in the head. I'm assuming that's what we're seeing here. This is a 200 micron trace width right here, which is about eight thou. I think we could easily get down to six thou trace space, like no problem at all. I still need to push it. I haven't done it yet, but I think it would be a non-issue. And in some places I didn't quite get all the way through it. You can see here, like these little sections, it's, eh, I didn't quite ablate all the way through. I was still tuning my settings. Okay, with all this tuned, I'm dangerous. I'm 
cutting copper real precise now. Now I could just solder all the parts of the board and be done. And this is effectively like what I did in the last video. I was just getting my copper cut out. No worries about solder mask, but this laser can ablate solder mask. So why wouldn't we also do that? You can just buy solder mask in a tube. It's UV curable. It's like actually very easy to use and buy. I tried two methods, one that Adafruit does with a transparency sheet. And then another one that I saw online with a silk screen. The transparency is a really cool approach. You get this beautiful gloss finish on the board after you get out the other end, but it's pretty hard to squeegee all of the solder mask nice and even across the board. I have my business card that I made out of a PCB in a little holder that I used to squeegee it in. It was okay, but it's tricky to get it right. The silk screen, however, works incredibly. I just got this cheap little silk screen in a wooden frame. And when you squeegee it across, you make sure that you have a very consistent layer of solder mask on the board. And when you peel it up very quickly, it's just a gorgeous, even finish. Wow, look at that. That's perfect. And after it's done curing, it's like a matte finish. But either way, however you apply it thinly, I then tossed it into a UV curing station. I happen to have a form cure, which I use, but you can buy a little nail salon, like UV curing station for like 30 bucks online. And those are gonna work great. I tossed mine in for like 15 minutes. It doesn't have to be fully cured, but it needs to be enough that it's at least a little resilient to some handling. Once it comes out, I toss it back into the laser. And then this time I load up all of my solder mask layer and I tune my settings for this. So I'm actually removing all the solder mask but I'm not really ablating that much more of the copper. This was a tricky one to tune, but I feel pretty good about where it's at now, especially if you get a nice thin, even layer like you do with the silkscreen method. And then it is a finished PCB. <laughs> it's just a beautiful single-sided PCB. The alignment for getting this back into the machine and getting this all perfectly aligned is very hard. This is part of the reason why I'm making my own little jig with some dowel pins to try and align this a little bit better. If you push too hard on the alignment and you cause the FR1 to crumble or compress a little bit, I mean, 100 microns is gonna nuke a fine pitch pad. I think I could also open up the solder mask pads a little bit so that even if there's some shift, it's not gonna completely cover the pad. This matters a lot less if you're doing really large parts, but I have a 0.5 millimeter pitch TQFP microcontroller on here. It's gonna matter. <laughs> it's gonna show up if I have it not aligned perfectly. There's also a cheeky technique where you can actually put the silk screen layer on a board too. On this blue one, I did this with white text and it came out really good. You ablate away the solder mask where the text should be and then you squeegee across a different color solder mask using a little IPA wipe as much of the top surface off as you can so it kind of stays in the wells that you just cut. Cure that and then you cut away all the normal solder mask layer. And it works really good. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of can't believe that I made this on my bench. And then you can actually cut out the board as well. With enough passes and a low and slow enough power, you can fully cut through a PCB and even drill a bunch of holes. Like this laser is, it's really cool. It can do pretty much every operation you need. Now that I have this process, I want to do a full production line example where I make 10 boards on the fiber laser. I do all the solder masking and then I run them on the lumen and I have a full from scratch, 10 actual units of a board from the time I have it designed to the time that it's populated, I think can be like 90 minutes. <laughs> That'd be so cool. And most of that isn't even manual time. Most of that is just the machines running. Ah, oh, how cool is that? So make sure to get subscribed so that you don't miss it. This method is really cool, but it does not come without its caveats. There are definitely problems with this approach. Assuming that alignment gets really consistent between operations, there is a big elephant in the room with this method, which is double-sided. If you can't do double-sided boards, it's not gonna be that representative of most designs that you're actually gonna wanna test in production. Now I've been spending a lot of time thinking about how we could try and get a really good double-sided approach here. And it seems like there's really two schools of thought. The first method is actually plating holes just like they do in a normal PCB fab. We know that we can cut out the boards and we can drill assuming that the heat is handled, but I think that's a settings tweak. So it kind of stands to reason that we could also plate them just like the PCB fab does. The hole would be drilled with a laser and not with a drill bit, which should be okay. There's a lot of ways that you can go about doing this. It's actually very interesting and I kind of want to explore it even if I don't think it's that practical because it's a really cool process. You effectively have to get something conductive in the holes and then you charge the whole thing as a cathode. I I believe. And then you can electroplate the entire board with copper and then you get a pretty good electrical connection through your vias. This requires a lot of chemical baths, time and manual work and application. I don't know. It just doesn't feel like the 3D printer future that I want from this process. So while possible, 
I don't really think that's super viable. The other approach is rivets. This method involves using tiny little brass rivets, popping them through the holes you drilled for your via, turning the board over and effectively crimping or hammering with a little, you know, press tool. Theoretically, you don't have to solder them, but I would want to. <laughs> There's a couple downsides to this approach too. These are always going to be bigger than a normal via you could get from a board shop. I guess you could just ship with that larger via diameter, but that's going to be a thing. That's going to be a design constraint. And also these rivets take up a little bit of height. So it's going to be really hard to get some of these underneath an IC, for example. You can squish them and I think you could get a really thick solder mask layer and it kind of makes up for the height difference, but you're still moving your part further away from the copper. So I think it'd have to be a really thin rivet. I'm going to explore all this and see what's the most viable, but I have a feeling the rivets are probably the best. If you have any ideas of other creative automatic ways that a via could be made, some connection between two layers of a board, ah, I want to hear about it. <laughs> Please drop it in the comments. I want any and all ideas right now. I, I feel like there's something out there, some good solution that still needs to be explored. Something else that's tricky with double-sided boards is aligning the two sides. If we drill first, we can use those drill holes on the back side to align the, the back etch layer. But I'm also thinking about getting really thin, single-sided copper clad, and then we just etch the front and back layers and then a score mark, and then the board folds over like that. Couple dabs of glue, and you have your double-sided board. Vias go from there. That way you don't have to worry about all these alignment steps. It's all just baked into the design on a single side. It's tricky. <laughs> There's a lot to this. The other huge thing here I can feel so many of you already starting to type, which I agree with, why not just use a board shop? They're cheap, they're excellent quality. Why not just send them off and wait? That's a good question. I think most of the time you should. We live in such a cool time where you can just kick a file over the fence to any board shop anywhere around the world and you're gonna get a beautiful board back. This truly, I think, is just for rapid prototyping. If you're part of an organization that cares a lot about saving every day of turnaround time, this matters. Getting it from seven days down to 90 minutes, that's Tremendous. Even when we were developing the V4 of the Lumen PMP, there were so many little boards that I would have loved to just bang out on a fiber laser really quick to validate that the idea was gonna be good and that my dimensions were accurate and my wiring was sane and correct before we sent them out to a board shop and that would have greatly de-risked so many things for me. But I think there is a place for this thing being a really useful tool for quick iteration, quick prototyping. Even if it's not gonna be your final design, you're actually not designing your board for what would actually go into production, but you effectively do an electrically equivalent thing to make sure that your circuit works, like kind of like a glorified breadboard. You have all your SMT parts in house. You just prototype breadboard this design out on a sheet of copper clad, single-sided or hopefully double-sided. Validate that it works. And now your schematic is validated and then you can toss it into a new board. Of course, some board layout stuff is gonna change some of how your design operates, but for the broad strokes of things, that would be really useful. So I think it'll have its place but it's not gonna replace the board shop. If you don't wanna spend the money on a fiber laser and you don't care about waiting around for beautiful boards to come in the mail, this isn't for you. Just wait a little bit and you're all good. But if you care about quick iteration and not hanging around and waiting for things, this is a really cool technique. And it's so little maintenance. I spent five minutes making these boards. The other 20, 25 minutes was just letting the machines run. And that was even optional. That was just putting the solder mask on. You can get a copper board, 10 minutes, no work from you. Send the file off, it's like a 3D printer. That's cool. So I think next up what I'm gonna do is try and actually make a quantity of boards using this method, make them on the Lumen and like do a full batch, soup to nuts, beginning to end, on my bench. Pretty cool. <laughs> that would be so cool. And a huge thank you to Xtool for sending me all this equipment. It has been really cool to play around with. It is an awesome machine. I am very, very happy with it. All right, that's it for this one. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.